This is the story of British Airways Flight 029. A while back, I made a video about a British Airways 747, one that flew through a forest and survived. Now, if you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend that you do, as it's an incredible story. In that video, I made a brief mention of another incident, which I dubbed the Nairobi incident. So this winter, this incredible story is brought to you by the same people that brought you that incredible story and starring the 747-100. On the 2nd of September, 1974, flight 029 was on its way from Zurich to Nairobi. The plane departed Zurich at 9 p.m. and they expected to reach Nairobi by about 5 a.m. in the morning. As they cruised high above the African continent, the captain in the left-hand seat was the one piloting the plane and the first officer manned the radios. The flight engineer calculated away in the cockpit as they stayed at 33,000 feet. That's how most of the flight went, hour after hour of nothingness as they cut through the darkness. Two and a half hours before landing, they were asked to climb to 37,000 feet. When they were about 150 nautical miles from the airport, the pilots started to go through the approach procedures and other checklists for Nairobi International Airport. They also went over the diversion airports that they'd use if they needed them. The captain expected to be cleared to runway 06, which was ILS equipped. So he decided to use the ILS system to get close to the runway and then fly the plane down manually once the runway was in sight. All in all, it was a solid plan and a simple one at that. Shortly after this, the pilots were in contact with the Nairobi radio controller. He cleared them down to 15,000 feet and towards a beacon called Golf Golf. Just as the captain had predicted, they were on track to land on runway 06. As the plane descended to 15,000 feet, they got a weather report from a pilot that had just landed at the airport. The cloud base was a bit low at 300 feet, which might cause them problems with sighting the runway. But the pilots continued with the approach. Now they had to descend to 12,000 feet. They were still flying towards the Gulf Gulf Beacon, and they were 30 nautical miles away. The beacon was situated on the summit of Mount Ngong. After that, they got further instructions to descend, this time to 10,000 feet. So, they closed the throttles and just let the plane lose altitude. As they leveled off, the plane had reached the Gulf Gulf Beacon. The controller gave them the following message. Speedbird 029, you are passing the Golf Golf Beacon, this time descend 7500 feet. Q&H is 1020 decimal 5. A pretty innocent transmission, and it told them what to do next. The pilots double-checked that they were indeed at the Golf Golf Beacon, both visually and using the needles in the cockpit. The co-pilot responded with, Roger, Speedbird 029, cleared to 5,000 feet on 1020.5. Their acknowledgement got no response. They set the autopilot to 5,000 feet, and the 747 started to descend towards the altitude that they had been cleared to. The cockpit was busy at this time. The captain was the one flying, the first officer was busy retuning some radios, and the flight engineer was busy with approach checklists. On its way down, the plane passed through some clouds, and all visual references were lost as the plane was plunged into darkness. They got a warning that signaled that they were 2,500 feet above the ground, which was noted by the crew. The 747 slowed down even more, and the controller now told them that they were 15 nautical miles from the runway. They could now line up with the runway. As the pilot selected the ILS frequency, the 747 started to turn to the left in an attempt to lock on to the signal. The first officer said 1,000 ago, indicating that they were 1,000 feet above their targeted altitude. Suddenly, in the cockpit, the ILS deviation warning light lit up. The plane was telling them that they were way too low. The glide slope pointers were out of view. The captain's first thought was that this was a false alarm and that there was no way that they could be that low. The pilots thought that their ILS system had failed them. At this point, the controller said that they were 8.5 nautical miles from touchdown and that they were cleared to land. As the first officer began to respond, he was cut off by the first officer saying, 200 feet decision height. They were just 200 feet off the ground. Just as he said that, the plane broke through the clouds 
and they could see for the first time how low they were. The flight engineer called, give full power, give full power, in an attempt to arrest the plane's descent. The captain responded immediately as he shoved all four engines to max power in an attempt to save his plane. And it worked by the smallest of margins. At its lowest point, flight 029 was just 70 feet from hitting the ground. For some context, the 747 itself, the newer ones at least, are 64 feet tall. For even more context, that's the height of seven basketball hoops or about 12 Brad Pitts stacked on top of one another. Your plane should never be 12 Brad Pitts away from the ground. That is unacceptable. That is how close they were to hitting the ground. Once they were climbing, the pilots declared a missed approach. A while later, the 747 made a safe landing and all on board were okay. Now this is as close as you can get to a close call. The seriousness is driven home by the fact that the report literally says, Quote, this was a very serious incident, which only avoided becoming a major catastrophe by the narrowest of margins, end quote. But the reason for this very serious near accident was very simple. In fact, I've already told you the cause. If you want to, you can take a guess. Pause the video, go down into the comments, and give it a go. I'll wait. Are you back? Well, the reason for this incident was that they descended too low because they misheard one number. The controller cleared them down to 7500, but the pilots heard that as 5000, and so they descended too much. As the crew conducted the go-around, the captain saw that 5000 had been selected in the autopilot's control panel. That's why they had been so low, because they practically asked the plane to descend that low. After the landing, the captain wanted to know why the controller had cleared them down to such a dangerous altitude. The controller denied having cleared them down to 5,000 feet, but the captain insisted. So, to settle this, once and for all, the officials pulled the tape recordings of their conversation, and lo and behold, the controller had cleared them down to 7,500 or 7,500 feet, but the pilots misheard that and set their plane to 5,000 feet. But listening to the recordings, they noted that the 7 was quite feeble, and a lot of emphasis was put on the 5. So subconsciously, the pilots assumed that they had been cleared down to 5,000 feet. But they had an opportunity to catch their mistakes. The first officer read back their clearance, and he clearly stated that they were cleared down to 5,000. But the controller wasn't paying attention, and he never corrected them. They then looked at the pilots, they had been on duty for about 9 hours, and by the time they landed at Nairobi, they were at the low point in their circadian rhythms, which meant that they'd be less likely to notice mistakes, especially if they were the ones making the mistakes. On top of that, the first officer had been taking some medication for an infection that he was having. As it turned out, those meds would really hamper his ability to think and make decisions. In short, he should not have been flying, but he didn't do that maliciously. He wasn't trying to hide that fact that he had meds in his system. He had seen a doctor and the doctor prescribed the meds and he wasn't told that he could not fly. When they looked at the medication that he had used, it turned out that the FAA did not recommend that pilots fly with that particular medicine in their system. Adding on to the first officer's troubles, he had not flown with this captain before and so was keen to make a first good impression. So he did all of his tasks quickly. In doing so, he was doing the tasks and not thinking about the implications of the tasks that he was doing. This coupled with a busy cockpit meant that conditions were ripe for mistakes to be made. Each pilot was busy doing his own thing. Like, they were so busy that the flight engineer had to ask both pilots to set their altimeter settings multiple times. The really shocking thing to come out of this incident was the knowledge that sometimes no one was monitoring the plane. You see, the non-flying pilot must be monitoring the flying pilot to catch their mistakes. But as they passed the golf golf beacon, no one was monitoring anybody. Basically, they probably thought that the other pilot was monitoring when in fact they were all engrossed in their own little worlds. But there's one final question here. Why didn't they heed the warnings? The plane was telling them that they were too low, 
but they were in a state of denial. They were convinced that what they had done so far was right. For example, when the pilots tuned the ILS, the glide slope showed that they were too low, but the pilots dismissed it. Then they had a warning tone when they were 2,500 feet above the ground. They ignored that as well. This is because on most approaches, you get warnings like these. And so they had, in a way, become desensitized to it. Then they got an altitude alert, which stated that they were approaching their selected altitude of 5,000 feet. This didn't set off any alarm bells, because as far as the pilots are concerned, being at 5,000 feet is okay. It's safe. Then, when they hit the decision height, the flight engineer quickly figured out what was going on and called for a go-round, thus saving all on board. You want to know the biggest kicker about this flight? The 747 at that time did not have a GPWS or a ground proximity warning system. It's a system, as the name suggests, which warns pilots about ground proximity. The investigators studied to see how a GPWS system would have changed the course of things. They found out that a GPWS system wouldn't have given them any advance warning that this plane already hadn't given them. I mean, they had warnings all the way from when they were at 2,500 feet above the ground. But a GPWS system would have shocked them into reacting. A loud pull-up warning is exactly what you need to get someone to act. Also, in reference to the British Airways Flight 888 video, in that video I said that the flight was operated by British Airways' overseas division, and a lot of you told me that that wasn't a thing. So I went back and checked that report, and then this one. Both of them state that BAOD was the operator of the flight. In fact, they go out of their way to state that. So if anyone knows what BAOD or British Airways Overseas Division is, do leave that information in the comments below. Do you know of any other near misses that you want me to cover? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.